Hey everyone, welcome back to another Ask GN episode. If you have questions for next time, leave them in the comment section below. And please try and upvote each other's actual questions so that I can find them rather than wading through a bunch of memes about cats, which makes it really difficult to find actual questions. So this time we have a couple good ones on buy or wait for Ryzen Plus slash Ryzen 2. Uh, a common one, did you make ROI on the Titan V? We also had a question about the GN mod mat and its spill resistant properties, which required us to film an infomercial. The first we've ever done. We hope you enjoy. Before getting to that, this content is brought to you by the Thermaltake Flow RGB closed loop liquid cooler, which is a 360 millimeter radiator plus three 120 fans that are RGB illuminated. The Thermaltake rain fans at that. This is a 4.5 gen Azatec pump, which is one of the faster pumps. You can learn more at the link in the description below. So let's do buy or wait first again. We did this for the, for Volta last time, I think. Largely the same answer here. Basically, if you need a computer today, then you should buy stuff today. The prices aren't gonna change that much at this point. It's looking like the Ryzen sale prices are more or less becoming the Ryzen prices. The retailers have only increased them once or twice in the last couple months back to where they were. And Ryzen 7 1700s and 5 1600s have stayed basically on sale almost for the last two months now. So I wouldn't worry too much about the prices going up. They might a bit after Christmas and the holidays, but uh, either way, these are still good processors and there's no reason to feel bad about buying a good processor if it does what you want it to do, obviously, like any production tasks or Blender or video rendering or any of that type of stuff that might take advantage of those cores. They're good for that already. And Ryzen Plus will be a refresh in the same way that some of Intel's Plus demarcated, demarcated lines have been refreshes. And Intel sort of started that with their plus uh, nomenclature that they just stick at the end of an existing fab process to make it sound like it's more advanced than it really is. And yes, they change things like, like fin height and gate pitch and things like that. But uh, ultimately, it's not a massive change. So, and it's gonna be the same for Ryzen Plus. It's, it is advancements on an existing CPU uh, that means it'll be things like tuning frequency, perhaps, or tuning memory timings or memory compatibility in general, or things of this nature that have been done or learned about over the past however many months since it launched, I guess about nine months at this point. So yeah, uh, the answer to wait for Ryzen Plus or buy comes down to, do you need a computer today? And if you do, then buy something. The way I always do this, and I think I said this in the last one too, is I would suggest asking yourself first, Am I happy with my current machine? The answer to that should be contingent on does your current machine do what you need it to do in a reasonable amount of time? Because you're asking about Ryzen Plus in this scenario, I would assume it's probably for some kind of production machine, not just gaming. So if that's the case, you should be looking at how long does it take me to render the things I need to render and then go find some benchmarks. How much faster is Ryzen now, today, is that speed benefit something that will benefit me now, today, or can I live with what I have? That's really all it comes down to. Now, timelines, Ryzen Plus and Ryzen 2 is really far away. There was a headline in our news video last week. We uh, had a, a source, a couple of article sources that said Ryzen 2, first quarter 2018. That's objectively incorrect. It's really easy to prove. You can look at AMD's own timelines, the ones that they gave us in March at the Ryzen announcement and launch. And it was not Ryzen 2 in first quarter of 2018. I can tell you that right now. So that's wrong. Uh, what we talked about in the video, the news video, I basically took that and without really explaining why, I called it Ryzen Plus. That's the reason why. Ryzen Plus will be coming out sometime in the first half. Now, I don't know exactly when, but I know that uh, there are gonna be talks about Ryzen Plus at CES. We're not under embargo for any of that. Uh, in fact, I don't think we've currently scheduled a meeting, but we'll work on one. But yeah, there will be conversations about it soon, within the next few weeks. I don't know when it launches, but um, the answer is still the same though. It's, you know, you're looking at a launch after probably January. So, 
can you live without a computer for a month? If so, wait. Uh, if not, by now, there's no reason to feel buyer's remorse about buying a processor that's still perfectly good and probably a bit cheaper than what's going to come out with Ryzen Plus. So that's how I look at it. That's also why I think the prices are basically permanent at this point. They're trying to leave room for when Ryzen Plus comes out, which is better, I guess, than what Intel normally does. They just keep everything the same price. But I don't know. Hopefully that gives you some idea of timelines and things like that. You're looking at first half for sure, probably. <laughs> So uh, that's kind of my understanding right now. And then the rest is personal preference. Did you make ROI on the Titan V? This is uh, not asked by any particular person. We had a couple different people asking this. So the Titan V was a $3,000 business expense. I say that specifically for a few reasons. A business expense is not, you just dropped $3,000 on a video card. You can afford lots of things. No. Uh, I did not spend $3,000 on a video card. My company spent $3,000 on a video card. There's a big difference there. One of us can afford it and the other one can't. So the company bought an expensive video card as a business expense. The very short answer, did you make ROI, is yes. The longer answer is, uh, and I'm only talking about this because I think a lot of people are interested in it, uh, the longer answer is yeah, there's different forms of ROI you can make as a media outlet. And that would be things like direct ROI. When you watch a video, you might be served a YouTube AdSense ad, or you might be YouTube Red uh, subscriber. Either of those situations gives us direct ROI, a return on investment where you're generating probably fractions of a penny with your views on that content. Uh, we can get a lot of views on that content. That's a lot of fractions of pennies, but it doesn't equal $3,000. So there's also indirect ROI. That would be things like the easy one, affiliate revenue. This product doesn't generate a lot of affiliate revenue. It's a $3,000 video card that doesn't fit our core audience. So we can kind of ignore that one. There's uh, where affiliate revenue would apply would be things like more affordable like cases and things like that. Uh, there's also direct ad sales that would be when we place an ad like the one that was probably at the start of this video unless it was for one of our own products but uh, we have ads for thermal grizzly thermal take we've run i fix it we've run uh, evga uh, we've run amd in the past we've run nvidia in the past so all these different advertisers uh, are the direct sales that would still kind of fall into the bucket with adsense ads where they go together but it boosts the uh, per view basically dollar value. It's still going to be low. You're still talking often, well, always pennies or fractions of pennies per view. Um, but then there's other forms of indirect ROI, like we sold a good amount of ads for December because it's end of year. This is pretty normal. End of year, everyone is, all the businesses are spending all the rest of their budget for the year. Basically every business because you're trying to get stuff in before tax season or you're trying to get, if you're a large company, uh, you're trying to spend your marketing budget or whatever it is so that you can claim you need it next year when they reevaluate your budget if they say you had $10,000 left. So we're gonna give you $10,000 less this year. So everyone's trying to spend money. Uh, so we sell more ads and we need to place those on videos and make sure we get views on them. Uh, so that's kind of indirect. There's also finally, it's this was largely about a new architecture and learning about it and trying to get uh, a head start on what we do when the next actual gaming architecture comes out. We did this with Vega Frontier Edition as well. It gives a, a huge leg up in terms of knowing what to expect and what quirks there will be in a new architecture. So now we have all this experience with Volta and when it's not, it probably won't be, almost certainly won't be called Volta, but when the gaming derivative comes out, uh, we'll have a bit of an advantage. We already know all the quirks of Volta, so if any reasonable amount of that finds its way into gaming, we already know it's test. That cuts out a huge amount of work for me in a couple months, and it puts us a bit ahead of competition. So that's another form of indirect ROI. Um, and then there's things like just, you know, we you become one of the only sources of information. So people in the industry are watching those videos, not just enthusiasts, but you're looking at industry contacts watching the videos. And that has a potential for ROI later 
down the road as well uh, because they see you as willing to invest in your company to prove a point or to learn about something and also sort of sends a message that, you know, hey, uh, if you don't send us the thing, we'll buy it anyway. So you can't really hide it from us. Um, so there, there's a lot that goes into it. There's obviously there's a, a, a financial standpoint. There's a status standpoint, establishing yourself in the industry as uh, very serious and taking your job seriously. Uh, there's learning a new architecture, trying to establish a foundation for later. And then there's recognition from your peers or from your uh, counterparts in the companies in the industry. That's also very important and highly valuable. So um, it's a big risk investment to buy a component like that. And it always is, but you, know, you gotta kinda gotta put your money where your mouth is sometimes and hope it pays off. Uh, so that's it for that one. Next question, first real question is Rapta who says, why does the performance of NVIDIA cards scale with core count when looking within the same architecture, but doesn't for AMD cards? This is partially true. Uh, Vega 56 and 64, you don't see a lot of difference in performance once you get past 56 CUs in this instance and go towards 64. AMD at this point becomes more memory bandwidth limited than anything else. NVIDIA tends to become ROPS limited. So where you'll see NVIDIA encounter issues would be something like Ghost Recon or Destiny 2. Both of these games are DX11 and both of them rely a lot on ROPS. Uh, and so if you look at the Titan V versus Titan XP, the gains there are like 4%. You look at those same two cards and something like Sniper, the gains are way more meaningful, upwards of 40% in some instances. So NVIDIA uh, doesn't, it's not always true that performance scales well with core count. Because again, Titan V is like 5120 cores versus 3584, whatever it is, on a 1080 Ti or Titan XP. Uh, yet it's 4% difference in a game like Destiny or um, Ghost Recon, depending on the settings. So not always true, but it is in a lot of cases. Same for AMD. AMD scales better in some games than others. Uh, but AMD tends to become memory bandwidth bound before they become bound by anything else. Uh, and it's also an issue of GCN reaching its limits at 64 CUs. That's pretty much always been the case. Once you get to 4096 SPs on an AMD device, you're really uh, getting diminishing returns now versus whatever the immediate SKU is below it. Maybe that's 60 or 56 or whatever it is. So it depends a lot on architecture, depends a lot on game, depends on the API, all that kind of stuff. Um, they become bound in different things. AMD, for example, for the longest time would become really bound in geometry. And they sort of started fixing that with Polaris. Polaris changed its uh, geometry pipeline. And then Vega later uh, changed the geometry pipeline further and started adding more advanced culling tasks or sequences to it. So um, NVIDIA, again, it's largely ROPS, I think, for the most part. There are some things they can become memory bound in, but with G5X, for example, you start to become more bound by the timings of the memory than the speed itself. The timings are a bit looser than GDDR5. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Hopefully that gives you some ideas for your question. Uh, next one is Dane of Starfall. I'm, this one's going to be quick. In your Titan V video where you test the limit of PCIe, you said that Rise of the Tomb Raider is not a good benchmark title. This is strange to me as I see the game on almost every GPU or CPU benchmark out there. Can you explain why you don't think it's a good benchmarking title? Rise of the Tomb Raider has a ton of variants. You can run the test like five or ten times and you'll see way more margin of, of error or variance than in basically any other title we benchmark. So we don't use it. Rise of the Tomb Raider also uh, it's, so there's, it's not really a perfect benchmarking title because if you run the built-in benchmark, it has all those variance issues and other issues. But if you get into actual gameplay, uh, it will start to smooth out a bit. The problem is those numbers don't really compare to a bunch of other sites because they don't necessarily test in the same areas. That's okay though, because we're kind of used to that. So I don't know, the way I look at it is rise. So when you're choosing a game to benchmark, you choose based on how consistent is it, how easy it, how easy is it for me to get to the area I want to benchmark, 
do I want to automate it or am I testing it manually in actual gameplay? So you take all those things, you decide what game, and then you're looking at things like API and you're looking at, does this game tell me something different than games one through six? If the answer is no, then it's of no value to us. So you look at things like DirectX 11, 12, Vulkan and OpenGL. Okay, we have a bunch of APIs to represent. Then you look at Unreal Engine, CryEngine, uh, Unity, and whatever else may be out there, often things like Frostbite or uh, standalone one-off engines. You could try to pick one of each of those and one of each API, uh, and they all represent something different. So the point isn't to have a lot of games, it's to have a, a set of very consistent games that represent different things. Because there's no point in having 25 games if at the end of the day, you could just kind of have five and it would represent the exact same thing. So basically with uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider, it's not very consistent. So the, I don't trust the results and that causes a lot of stress and retesting, so it wastes time. It's not heavily played, so it's not worth the inconsistency. A game like PUBG, I could probably argue for it, even though it's pretty inconsistent and unoptimized. But that's because a ton of people play it. Uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider doesn't have that going for it. So not a huge reason to, to fight against the title for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we basically looked to, to benchmark Vulkan, looked to benchmark uh, compute tasks. You look to benchmark things that are geometry, geometrically complex things that are tessellation complex or heavy, things that are uh, using asynchronous workloads and pipelines, and then different APIs. And you should end up with six to eight games. I like to pull about eight, and then we start cutting games as they prove to be bad for testing, normally from inconsistency, or maybe they've just released a patch that botches all of our numbers and we'd have to rerun it. So you just, you know, we'll cut this one out for this benchmark and we'll reintroduce it later. Um, I, hopefully that gives, that gives kind of a bunch of different things to think about. <clears throat> Nori SS says, GN covers performance engineering and stability characteristics. What about warranty support? What happens if something goes bad? We actually wrote years ago, I wrote a warranty support table that kind of gave an idea of the uh, warranty period and whether they do cross shipping and things like that. So the trouble is with warranties, it's kind of different in each region. I know how EVGA's warranty works in the US. I know they're probably at least 90% of the time gonna be pretty good about their warranty in the US, but I've heard that they're not so great for some other countries. And it's just a matter of where does the, co the company operate? Do they service each region the same? And the answer is normally no. No one really has that many resources to spare. So. If I were to start talking about warranties, it'd have to always have a big tag of like, in the US, and 55% of our viewers are not in the US. Uh, so I just leave it out. And honestly, there are some things that, although it would, be, it would be great if we could reasonably talk about warranties, there are some things that are better left to user reviews, just by the nature of aggregating thousands of them. And I think warranties are one of those things because you can't necessarily trust a user review on Amazon or Newegg of a router because they're gonna say, this router sucks, my internet's slow. No, your ISP is slow, the router doesn't suck, your ISP sucks. Uh, but you can trust user reviews generally for things like warranties because that's a very basic human interaction between a company and a customer. Um, so I, I would rather leave it to the aggregate of thousands of users uh, than, uh, we've done kind of like undercover warranty or service calls before with SIs, I by Power, Cyber Power Origin. I've called each of them um, basically disguised as a customer and asked for support and um, included those in those reviews, but that's about the most we can do. I can't really test the warranty process unless I were willing to like delay the review by weeks and intentionally break components and see what they did or something. Uh, and that's still only really one representation. And then if they figure out it's me, obviously, they're gonna make sure everything is perfect because they know it's gonna go into a review. Next question, Supa says, in your review of the Fractal Define R6 while discussing GPU temperatures and the vertical orientation, you stated, quote, the vertical GPU mount caused a huge temperature increase as usual. Can you explain why vertical mounted GPUs tend to run hotter, quote, as usual? 
We did this in a couple of videos and I didn't do it again in the R6 video. The short of it is you're putting an open face card an inch or two away from uh, an insulating four millimeter thick glass panel. Those open face cards, they need air, they need a lot of air in front of them to pull air into the fans. And then when they're done with the air, uh, you kind of think about how they're laid out. That air, it can't go straight through the PCB. So it has to come out the sides. So it's coming out wherever the fins are oriented, typically out the top. And as that air spews out of the open face cards, it's going to go two places. One, it'll go up into the CPU radiator if you have one above it. And that'll make your CPU a bit warmer, but it'll get rid of the heat and push it out of the case. The other one is it'll go down, hit a power supply shroud, which is now probably right below your GPU because it's vertically mounted, uh, and kind of get stuck there, maybe even sort of bounce back up and get recirculated. And then ultimately what happens is that piece of glass starts warming up. Your air gets stuck against it. You can't get new air in fast enough. So the card runs a lot warmer, sometimes in the 90s, whereas a horizontal mount might be in the upper 70s or the low 80s. Uh, and it's just a matter of what kind of card it is. Now, this is a scenario where, so first of all, full disclosure, these are really meant for liquid cooling. But this is a scenario where a blower card might actually be better because the blower card doesn't need as much exposure to air in terms of a, a big wall of air right in front of the cooler. And it pushes air only one place, and that's out of the case rather than all over the case. So that's what it comes down to. The next one, Serpent XF, XSF. This was a fun question. What was your first ever graphics card? Why did you get into the computer industry and reviews of computer components? Do you have any IT certifications? First graphics card, I think, was the ATI X1800 512 megabyte card. I'm pretty sure there was a 256 model also. And I spent a lot more money on the 512. And I remember the guy at CompUSA saying, you're never going to need 512 megabytes of memory. Uh, and uh, I remember hearing the same thing when I bought a GTX 8800 Ultra later. I don't remember how much memory that had, but it was another one of those, you're never going to need that much. And look where we are today. At the time, it was kind of accurate, but so I, out of uh, interest, I went and looked up this card. I found reviews of the ATI X1800 to see what people said about it when it came out around 2004 or 5. I think this was from CNET. It was just the top result. So this is, this is just kind of fun. You'll see the parallels in a second. CNET said, although we weren't thrilled with its design and wish that it brought more to the table than simply catching up with NVIDIA's feature set, the ATI Radeon X1800 XT's performance is hard to knock, at least for certain games. The results remain consistent with the latest generation's conclusion that ATI fares better at direct 3D-based titles like Half-Life 2, and NVIDIA dominates an OpenGL 3D APIs uh, with Doom 3. So a bit of the inverse. AMD is better with, uh, with Doom right now, and uh, NVIDIA is back to dominating with DirectX 11. So that was kind of fun to read. They also said, two of our biggest gripes have to do with the Radeon X1800 XT's design. The most obvious is its double wide form factor. CNET was annoyed that the card took two expansion slots. I have a shelf of video cards that are 2.5 to three expansion slots now. So that's, that's the, uh, the state of the industry when I got into it. Um, next or last question here, Carl says, can I use the GN anti-static mod mat with correct capitalization included as an oversized mouse pad? Is it spill resistant? So technically in the product page, there's a line in there that a lot of you have noticed that says not intended for use as a mouse pad. And after that live stream where we did overclocking for like two and a half hours, I was using mice on this pad the entire time. And at the end of it, I was like, maybe undersold its potential there. You can use it as a mouse pad. We didn't advertise it that way because I don't want people who want a mouse pad buying an anti-static mat uh, that is not really meant for that purpose if you're only planning to use it as a mouse pad. We appreciate the sales, but you know, it's just like it's there's an intended purpose for it. You can use it as a mouse pad, but it is kind of a grippier surface. Uh, it's more towards the if you ever buy one of those aluminum mouse pads that's got a smooth and a rough surface. It's kind of in between those. There's a bit more texture to it, so there'll be some drag on the mouse. Uh, 
So depending on if you like that or not, you could use it as a mouse pad. But I didn't want people buying it. I would rather people be pleasantly surprised that they can use it for a mouse than people be disappointed that they can't use it for a mouse. So that's why I didn't really advertise it that way. Um, and is it spill resistant? The answer is yes. We spilled some liquid on it the other day and it basically just sits there on the surface. So, um, but that was the whole point of going with this as opposed to like a felt or fabric top mouse pad because this is a rubberized surface. It's textured uh, and it's, again, it's anti-static. Uh, it makes it spill resistant, makes it pretty damage resistant and protects the table. But not necessarily perfect for mouse pads. Those, those things don't go together. You could use it, but you know, I would suggest only doing that if you also have another purpose for it, like wanting to use the anti-static part of it and build stuff on the surface. And that's all for this one. So I think all these questions came from Discord this time because the YouTube comment section was so flooded with non-questions that I had a hard time finding any. If you have questions, post them below and everyone help float those to the top. Uh, if you want to join the Discord, you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus and donate to join our Discord for the community. Or you can help us out at store.gamersnexus.net or store.gamersnexus.net slash modmat if you want to buy one of these now that we've done the uh, marketing pitch saying that it is hydrophobic or something. It's not actually hydrophobic, but it's kind of spell resistant. I'm not very good at marketing. Uh, all right, subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time. That was a good one.